Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be here. Chris, thank you very much for the invit invitation. It's a real pleasure to have traveled half the world to spend some time with you. Today I'm going to share uh, some of my 14-year journey with you. And I'm struck that being at a conference like this where we're talking about mass participation with Engage, Evolve and Excel, how many of you in this room are trying to do the exact same thing that we've been doing for the last 14 years. So uh, we're inspired by helping communities be the best they possibly can be and helping communities to gel and uh, really experience what it is to be part of this community, this scene. I started my working life as a programmer in a large international bank. I worked alongside organizations like IBM, uh, where I learned all about responsibility, teamwork, procedure, standards and deadlines, and an ordered approach to everything. I spent a couple of years in the Air Force in South Africa, and I spent many years in boarding school before that. And so most of these learnings came pretty easy to me. When I got an idea in my head, there was usually no stopping me. I was bold beyond my years when I was young. Folks who knew me often said that I was driven, outspoken, and a challenge to work, to, to work with. I'm taking on a journey today that involves 14 years of building this thing that we call Park Run. As I do this, it is possible that I could leave you with the view that I did this all on my own. But that's far from the truth. Park Run is a collaborative effort, has been from the word go. It's all about volunteers. It's all about people who have engaged with me to help build this, in, uh, this movement. So uh, I hope you enjoy that. The attitude that came with, uh, with me from boarding school, from the Air Force, from all the, the work experience, has stood me in good stead as I've embarked on this journey. Putting my shoulder to the wheel, being bloody minded, forging ahead against significant challenges and opposition, and always trying to do what I thought was the best thing to do and the best for all. So the story I'm going to share with you is a journey of discovery, not something that I was properly prepared for, but something that I have loved every step of the way. So what is this thing we call park run? As there are only three park runs in Singapore, I will forgive you for not really understanding it. And so you'll give me a few minutes to explain it. Park run is a weekly timed walk, jog, or run in a very pleasant and safe environment that's completely managed by volunteers. It is and always will be free to participate. It started in October 2004, making us about 13 years old. So we're teenagers now. Some call us disruptive. The first ever event took place in Bushy Park in Teddington in the United Kingdom. And we had 13 runners at that event. There were five volunteers, although those volunteers weren't recorded. There are two formats for Park Run. We have a Saturday event, which is for everybody, and that's a 5K event. And then we have a junior series that is 2Ks, and that's on a Sunday. Today, there are 5 million Park Run members. We've recorded 41 million runs, and the events take place in 1,800 event, uh, venues across the world in 20 countries. We add between 30 and 50 new events every month. Since our inception, we have executed 250,000 events. Most weeks see a quarter of a million people participate across these 20 countries. And that number grows all the time. So whatever statistic I give you today, it'll be wrong in a week's time. 
We took 13 years to add 35 million runs to the book, and this year we'll see another 13 million runs, run performances added. The benefits of this weekly community include more active folks, more socially engaged communities, a better understanding of volunteering. We have programs for reducing reoffending, programs for the visually impaired and the hard of hearing. We address diabetes, long-term illnesses, and we support our national health services. Parkrun will be free forever for everyone. I'd like to take you back to that very, very first event. And this picture is the picture that I took. I'm the person with the camera just before I was about to set these people off. In, prepara in preparing for this event, I spoke to my club, my running club, and one of the other local running clubs. I also counseled with some of my best friends. My girlfriend at the time, now my wife, she was part of the counseling service. And I had a lot of uh, people tell me that this would never work. I had my club suggest that I should make it monthly rather than weekly, but I insisted that it had to be every single week. Why? Because I wanted the re regularity. You'll see from the format that nobody tells us that they're coming to a park run. They just pitch up on the Saturday. So it's, uh, you want to make it regular so people can take the time off when they want to. It took about four months of preparation, running and measuring the course, deciding on the methods that I would use to time and how I would record the runs. My main concern in the beginning was to keep it low-key and simple. So much so that there was no pre-registration. There were no costs. Anyone could take part. Basically, I removed all the restrictions to participation. There were no barriers to taking part. You could run with a dog, in fact, when we started, it was, you could have as many dogs as you wanted, but clearly we've had to adjust that. But you could also run pushing a pram or a buggy. On that first day, my wife Joanne and I arrived at 8.30 in the morning. And it was really very simple. There was no pre-registration. These people gathered on what was then the start line, that yellow line in front of uh, their first feet. It's interesting looking back 13 years. Everyone's got white trainers on. Uh, you can obviously see some of these people are club members. Eight of those people came from my club, and I think the few others from another club. And there's one person there, the lady in the back with the blonde hair, who wasn't a runner at all. On that day, the fastest runner ran 18 minutes and 47 seconds, and the slowest ran 29 minutes and 39 seconds, giving an average of 22 minutes. It's interesting that today at Park Run, the average is much closer to 35 minutes. As we've invited people who, to walk the course and to gain their experience over as many months as, or weeks that they want. Just before I set this group off, I gave them a quick briefing of the course. I said there were no markers, there were no marshals, uh, showed them a map. I said, if you get lost, come back next week and do it again. And I said, uh, when you finish, the most important thing that you need to do is you need to come with me for coffee afterwards. So whilst I wasn't aware at the time what I was actually creating, but it has become probably the most important thing that we at Park Run do, which is the socializing that goes on after the run. The run is vital, it's important, it helps people get active and it changed their lives. But what happens in the coffee house after is what makes communities. This is where our volunteers gather, this is where we do the, the race uh, or the run uh, processing. This is where we discuss what we did last week and what we're going to do next week. And this is where we make our friends. So I continued with this format for at least two years before I started my second event. 
At the time, I resisted all the pressure that was coming on me to create a second event because, after all, this was my event, these were my friends, and I was getting my coffee morning every single week with these guys. So it was important for me to have my event. People kept telling me that this format was great, it was changing people's lives, and they kept saying, please do more, but I resisted because, after all, this was just a free weekly timed run with your mates in a park. As we added more events, we revised the system that supported these events. We had a back office function that meant we would receive the results from the, the new events and we would then process these on a Saturday. The more events we added, the longer the process took. And I do remember sitting at that PC all day on a Saturday, processing these events and publishing the, the, results, uh, the results to the website. This function, obviously, as it took longer and longer, we had to innovate. And as we did, we innovated in a number of ways. One of the things we did, we introduced uh, a barcode for every single individual. I have my barcode on my arm. You can download and print yours on a piece of paper, but this is mine. It has my emergency contact details on here. Just in case I should ever collapse in the street, you'd be able to contact my wife and let her know that I'm down and out. We also automated the whole processing system so that you didn't need to have anyone monitoring the system when the results are in processing. And it's been a, an evolution uh, the, the evolving of what we do has grown and grown, just as Chris was saying earlier in the speech. One of the things we did from day one was we emailed everybody their results at the end of uh, the day and we wrote a little report, we produced some pictures and we sent them to everybody. And as it's gone on, we still do that. We have a newsletter that gets produced in every single country and I think we email three million people every single week with an update on what happened last week, what's new this week, et cetera, et cetera. We also now engage people, for instance, those who register but don't run, we engage them in a program of emails that invites them to come and join the fun with us. So being evolving your, um, your operation is a very important part about keep getting people involved in the community. So why did I start Parkrun? I've told you a little bit about how I started it, but the real reason why I started it. Well, I was 42 years old. I'd been very successful in business. I'd traveled all around the world as an IT consultant working with an international software company. And uh, I'd found myself in a situation where I'd been promoted beyond my, uh, uh, my level of capability. So basically, I got fired. But at the same time, I was training for the London Marathon, and I was hoping to run my best ever marathon, but I got injured. So these two things collided. They came about the same time. And I thought, well, the injury was significant enough that I probably would take me a long time to recover, and I would probably never achieve those sorts of running results again. I thought this was my time to give something back to the community. You've seen from that first event that actually meeting in the uh, coffee house was a very, very important part of me recovering my own self-esteem, driving my own mental health back to where it should be. And running has played a part in me addressing my own mental health issues throughout my whole life. So it seemed very natural to start this event, to invite my friends down and get them in the park and then to go for coffee afterwards. Those early days where we took one step forward every single week, we made small enhancements to what we were doing and slowly we built the ethos of what we stood for. All about social cohesion, about community, about friendships, about uh, helping people be the best they possibly could be. All of that formed the basis of what became Park Run. I started to accumulate all these ideas and create the rules which now 
we live by. Obviously, it was free to enter, so the whole commercialization of Park Run was also an issue. And I had decided very early on that I wasn't going to commercialize Park Run. But you can't just keep throwing your own money at these events, expecting that it will all work out. So clearly, I started to work on some of those ideas as well. A major turning point came very early on in about 2008 when I was negotiating with the local, um, our national governing body for some support. And at the very last minute, for moral reasons, I stepped back from that support. And that was my sort of um, brain, the moment that everything became clear, that I would have to make this work on my own, and I would have to make Park Run stand on its own two feet. We added some international territories. Australia and South Africa were some of the first. And I think you'll know that these international territories are very bold, um, creative uh, environments, and they put a lot of pressure on me made it very challenging in those days. In the early days, uh, I did everything myself. I wrote the software that Parkrun used to process their results. I was the run director. I managed the volunteers. I produced the results. And I wrote the rule book. There was no prospect of this being a proper business not to begin with. I paid the first employee out of my own wages, and that was in 2008. And my first meaningful sponsor came on board in 2009, followed by the second one in 2010. I employed my second employee in 2009, and uh, we were on our way. But I still wasn't employed by Park Run. I was still out doing my consultancy. I realized at that time that what we needed to do was to ensure that we could grow with very few overheads. So I wasn't looking to build a massive organization. In fact, I, I was looking to build something that provided massive benefit, but with very low overheads. And so I worked, I used all my IT experience to come up with a self-service module, self-service um, uh, framework. And I put that to good stead, and we have lots of technology these days that allows our volunteers to completely serve themselves. We added Denmark in 2009, Ireland in 2010, Australia in 11, and South Africa in 12. I built a very small but dedicated board, mostly friends, who would help me guide Park Run. I discovered, quite late actually, how important volunteering was. So you'll see I didn't record volunteering on day one. We only started recording them in 2009. But if Park Run was to flourish, it would have to be run by volunteers. And we created this ethos where people in their community served their community by putting on the Park Run. I realized I had to make volunteering fun, I had to make it easy, and I also had to create a situation where the volunteer knew that they were serving themselves as much as they were serving Park Run. We discovered that volunteering is a reward in its own right. It isn't so much about giving back, it's about serving yourself. As a volunteer, you learn skills that you perhaps don't have uh, or didn't have before. You learn to be a leader in your community. And you learn that there is a huge self-satisfaction and reward doing something of that nature. And the fact that we have so many people volunteering at Park Run is a testament to our movement. It's a testament to what we do and how we do it. So let's talk a little bit about the growth. I said that we started with 13 runners and five volunteers. Well, in year one, that first year, we had 99 individual runners. And between them, they ran 400 events. That was that first year. In year five, this had grown to 12,000 
uh, participants with 54,000 runs between them. In year 10, we saw 334,000 participants who between them ran 2 million runs. And as we had started to record volunteers, we also knew that in that year we had 43,000 volunteers. We're now in our 14th year, and so far this year, there have been a million and a half participants. 10 million runs have been recorded, and we've recorded 200,000 volunteers. So that's not the collective participation, that's just in those years. So far this year, we've added a million new members. Initially, I didn't focus on the makeup of our company structure or the board. I built the company as a not-for-profit, and the focus was on the events themselves and on the volunteering. People just did things because we, they felt that what we were doing was good. The board consisted of people who I felt could help me. I learned very quickly that it is important to plan control. It's easy to drive growth, but it's not always that easy to grow well. How you drive growth and control the ethos of a movement is vital. As you build your governance team, you learn very quickly how to handle, handle challenges. I discovered too that the, round, the role of a founder is vital. Growing internationally can also be challenging. These new territories are often innovative and creative, and they're always putting pressure on the boundaries. I learned that controlling how international territories are governed is important when you want to ensure adherence to your set of values. So in 2015, I found myself in a position where I had gifted Parkrun to the world I'd given it away. All the international territories were separate entities, each with their own leadership and, where appropriate, a board. A separate technology team servicing the world with many demands on it and challenges. The majority of our revenue came from the UK or Australia, Ireland and South Africa. I began to lose the plot. I saw that the problems, sorry, I started to see the problems and not the opportunities. People who had previously been very important in the team no longer held those roles of responsibility. Some staff lacked, uh, sorry, some staff got stuck in the old ways and they were not willing to change as we moved, moved from a single event to many events. Multiple demands, often not strategic, and coming from individuals who meant well, but who didn't fully understand the strategy or the future. So I actually stopped enjoying every day. I felt I needed to strengthen the organization and draw the power back to the center, align our strategies and our initiatives and our resources. So I established a global organization, Parkrun Global. This is a global charity, and it covers all of the parkrun territories. I retained the IP at the center, and I also retained the te technology and our retail. I appointed Nick Pearson as our CEO, a person with 20 years of sports retail experience and a passionate athlete with a good understanding of parkrun, and we began the process of rebuilding the organization, keeping all that was good and revitalizing the parts that had drifted away. I stepped away from the day-to-day -day operations. Sorry, go back. So, it's been a very difficult journey for me. I've, uh, I've obviously had to hand over this thing that I created, and I'm sure most of you especially those of you who are parents, will understand how difficult that might be. Stepping away has been hard, but it's allowed me to focus on a new role, the role, the role of a founder, what that means to the board, and also an ambassadorial role. 
it also has allowed me to mentor people who are in the early stages of creating social networks, social enterprises, where they plan to deliver change in, in the social environment. I've learned that the humbling role of a founder is about putting others in a position to succeed beyond their wildest dreams. My role of a founder isn't to be involved in the day-to-day -day work. In fact, it's about allowing this team of creative individuals to take it much further than I could. Parkrun is my legacy, and it's something that I can never walk away from. You've already seen that it's easy to engage, troublesome and challenging to evolve, but how do you excel? I'd like to share a very quick video to you, which I hope goes some way to explain this. If you've learned a lot about leadership and making a movement, then let's watch a movement happen start to finish in under three minutes and dissect some lessons. First, of course, a leader needs the guts to stand alone and look ridiculous. But what he's doing is so simple, it's almost instructional. This is key. You must be easy to follow. Now here comes the first follower with a crucial role. He publicly shows everyone else how to follow. Notice how the leader embraces him as an equal. So it's not about the leader anymore, it's about them, plural. Notice how he's calling to his friends to join in. So it takes guts to be a first follower. You stand out and you brave ridicule yourself. Being a first follower is an underappreciated form of leadership. The first follower transforms a lone nut into a leader. If the leader is the flint, the first follower is the spark that really makes the fire. Now here's the second follower. This is a turning point. It's proof the first has done well. Now it's not a lone nut, and it's not two nuts. Three is a crowd, and a crowd is news. A movement must be public. Make sure outsiders see more than just the leader. Everyone needs to see the followers, because new followers emulate followers, not the leader. Now here come two more people, then three more immediately. Now we've got momentum. This is the tipping point, and now we have a movement. As more people jump in, it's no longer risky. If they were on the fence before, there's no reason not to join in now. They won't stand out, they won't be ridiculed, and they will be part of the in-crowd if they hurry. And over the next minute you'll see the rest who prefer to stay part of the crowd, because eventually they'd be ridiculed for not joining. And ladies and gentlemen, that is how a movement is made. So let's recap what we've learned. If you are a version of the shirtless dancing guy, all alone, Remember the importance of nurturing your first few followers as equals, making everything clearly about the movement, not you. Be public, be easy to follow. But the biggest lesson here, did you catch it? Leadership is over glorified. Yes, it started with the shirtless guy and he'll get all the credit, but you saw what really happened. It was the first follower that transformed a lone nut into a leader. There's no movement without the first follower. See, we're told that we all need to be leaders, but that would be really ineffective. The best way to make a movement, if you really care, is to courageously follow and show others how to follow. When you find a lone nut doing something great, have the guts to be the first person to stand up and join in. So as you build your movement, uh, it's important that you understand and recognize that you need to know how you, that you're doing it well. Empowering others to adopt the values of the movement for themselves, building a follower base, manage and control the framework, discipline where necessary, celebrate everything possible, and constantly develop the strategy, but evaluate all the developments against the framework and the principles, because nothing stands still. So we are a social enterprise. It's a term that I think is often misunderstood. It doesn't mean we're a bunch of fluffy guys who just want to make everything sound great. 
we have to run an organization and that organization has to understand its costs and uh, its growth. So revenue and resources are key to every organizational movement. The more you have, the more you can achieve and the larger your impact might be. However, and this is particularly for us, an unbalanced focus on revenue can lead to an unbalanced focus on impact. So it can lead to a drive for wealth rather than a drive for impact. And I think we have the privilege in our organization that that's not the case. So while we have partners and sponsors, and we are challenged to promote these partners, what you will never see us do is overtly sell any particular item. Why? Because Park Run is such a diverse organization and there is no one item that will be applicable to all of our community. We want everyone in Park Run to be the best they can be. So what does the future hold? We will continue to do more. We will do more events. We will do more diversity. We will do more social inclusion, more health and more well-being. We will deliver interventions in the poorest areas and postcodes. We will continue to focus on equality and inclusion for all. We'll continue to grow our prisons program, helping reintegrate and reducing reoffending. And we'll also keep expanding our latest initiative, which is something we call the GP, the Park Run G, uh, Practices. It's an initiative where the Royal College of GPs invite individuals to go to a park run, to volunteer, to walk, to run, to jog, rather than to prescribe them a pill for some uh, minor Ill, Ill that they're having. An example of one, uh, one example of what we've done to address this is our junior park runs. So we started a junior park run in, uh, fairly early on, but only really consolidated in the last couple of years. We have about 200 junior park run events in the UK, and most of these are located in areas of uh, disadvantage. The most commonly observed benefit in a junior park run participants is that the children have improved attitude towards physical activity. 61% of parents say that their child uh, about this say this about their child, and that the benefit is more likely to be seen in deprived communities. Disadvantaged families often face multiple challenges and pressures. Being physically active is not the norm for everyone. When basic needs such as getting food on the table, keeping a roof over your head, and earning enough to buy the basics are a struggle, then attending a junior park run is not high up on their list. So when we launch these events in these deprived areas, it's important that we are not an imposition on that community, but rather we include the local people in the delivery and the um, running of that event. So what are the runs themselves? We are now over 5 million members, with over 3 million people who have taken part in a park run. Over 337,000 people have volunteered. We're about to hit 1,800 events at over 20 countries, and 107,000 people in the UK who previously identified themselves as inactive have become active over the last couple of years. Our plan is that on our 20th birthday in October 2024, we will expect to have 5,000 weekly events, with over a million people participating in Park Run every single week, and with over 100,000 volunteers looking after those a million people every single week. And we expect that to cover 50 different countries. Leading an organization to long-term success requires brilliant, capable, intelligent, and creative people. 
if I have one thing to say to you, it's surround yourself with those people. As a founder, I'm fortunate that I can always hold everyone inside the organization to account for upholding the values that I set out in our charter. It's hard to believe that a simple, free, weekly, five-kilometer run in a park could be the vehicle that has caused so much change in our society. I'm always thankful to everyone who's played a part in that, whether it's as a runner or a volunteer or someone who's actually decided to join us as a staff member. We're all in this together. Organizations like Park Run, and I believe there are a number of you in this room, are all trying to make the world a better place. We have this in common. Deciding how to do this stuff is often very difficult. There are so many causes, so many needs, and so many demands on us. It's a huge advantage when you're allowed to focus on the one thing that you're best at. For, for us at Park Run, it's helping everyone to be the best they can be through a medium of a run in a park. Confusingly, some would interpret that as helping people to be fitter, faster, and eventually more gorgeous. But that's the least of what we do. We help people to get to know their community, to get to know the people in that community, to build bonds that never existed before, and bonds that stand the test of time. Bonds that help people to come out of isolation and to face crisis with others. So looking back at 2004 when I started Park Run, I could never have envisaged any of what we've seen here today. I could never have guessed that the values that we stand for would become so universal. And what's more mind-blowing is the fact that we've only just started we're at the very beginning of our journey. And so I say to each and every one of you, continue to strive to be the best you can be and look to change people's lives in the most positive way you can. And count every success because it is a success. Thank you very much.